Okay guys, welcome back. It's lesson 38, part 3 of our three-part series on the standard model of particle physics and quantum field theory. Let's just talk about what's left to do. Uh, last time we discussed bound states, including positronium and charmonium, and a little bit about isotopic spin and pions and so on. Today I want to discuss decays and scattering. And that means basically Feynman diagrams. We're going to get into that a little bit. I had hoped to get the Higgs mechanism in today, but I just couldn't make it fit. So we're going to have to do that one next time. So sorry about that. Uh, next time is just going to be fun stuff. Uh, and I don't know exactly what yet, but uh, we'll find out on Tuesday. But uh, for now, let's talk about these guys. Now there's, there's two basic aspects to the problems of decay and scattering. One is the kinematic constraints that are placed on the process by basically relativity and Lorenz invariance of results and things like that. Um, because we're going to be doing sort of relativistic calculations, uh, I'm going to try to simplify the math by letting c be equal to 1 most of the time. We're going to be using four vectors, which are four component objects. Uh, the time component is the energy, and the three spatial components are the momentum in the three space directions. The uh, metric we're going to be using has a trace of negative 2. That means that the time comes in with a positive sign and the three components of momentum come in with a minus sign when you're calculating inner products between momenta. And uh, basically Everything that goes into and comes out of a reaction has to be a real particle. And what that means is it has to be on the mass shell. That's a technical lingo that basically means its energy is equal to its rest energy squared. I sh excuse me. Its energy squared is equal to its rest energy squared plus its momentum squared. So um, it would be like E squared equals m squared plus p squared in units where c is equal to 1. And uh, all real particles have to have that property. What we're going to find out is that the internal particles that are involved in various reactions don't need to lie on the mass shell. In fact, generally they don't. Um, in the end, energy and momentum have to be conserved. You may remember many lessons ago, three or four lessons ago, I talked about uh, when you go to calculate the amplitude of something happening anywhere, uh, you end up conserving momentum. And if you add up all the amplitudes of happening any when, you end up conserving energy. And, uh, or you could say that the four momentum is conserved. That's all four components, x, y, z, and time. And that includes energy and momentum conservation automatically. Now let's talk about uh, Fermi's golden rule. We, we ran into this uh, back when we were talking about the neutron capture reaction, and uh, it goes back to time-dependent perturbation theory. It's actually a consequence of time-dependent perturbation theory. And uh, we want to generalize this to uh, the situations we're going to discuss today, particle decays and um, scattering. I pulled this page right out of the particle data group handbook. Um, I think this was maybe a couple years ago, but it hasn't changed much, I don't think. So uh, it's basically, this is Fermi's golden rule for particle decays in a relativistic framework that we're going to be using today. And notice it looks a fair amount like the one we had before. The D capital Phi is the basically the phase space. It's the uh, density of states in the phase space. The script m squared is the amplitude to go from the initial to the final setup squared. That cor sort of corresponds to our old VAB squared. There's a 2 pi to the fourth over 2m. Um, the 2 pi to the fourth shows up because we're working in four-dimensional space-time now, and uh, m is basically the initial mass of the particle that's decaying. So um, anyway, that's the math. Now, uh, the thing I want to focus on is that the only thing that isn't prescribed by the momentum of the outgoing particles here is the script M. The script M is the thing 
that we need to calculate with quantum mechanics. Everything else in this page is dictated just by the Lorenz invariance of the result and the, and the requirement that uh, energy and momentum be conserved, basically. So uh, let's also look at the, they have a similar page, a couple, you know, it's a couple of sections later in the handbook that describe cross-sections in the same sense. And basically, again, there are kinematic constraints that have to do with uh, relativistic invariance. And then there's this script M thing, which is the quantum mechanical amplitude to go from the incoming particles to the outgoing particles. And that's really what I want to focus on today. Understand that you can, uh, once you get that, you can just plug into these formulas for the kinematic aspects and then figure out the cross-section and the decay rate. So... Moving ahead, how do we calculate that script M? That's the question. So I want to do a little overview first, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. The first thing is if you make a diagram that describes the process whose cross-section or decay rate you want to compute, um, each vertex is going to get a factor that depends on the particles connected. So for example, if you have a photon emitted by a charged particle, there's going to be a vertex factor which describes the amplitude of that process happening. So uh, in the case of a particle being emitting a photon or absorbing a photon, it's going to be proportional to the charge. And it's also going to have uh, things like h-bar and c floating around in there. Um, in units when h-bar and c is 1, basically it's just the, the size of the charge is the only thing that matters. and uh, that's usually reflected in something called the fine structure constant. But if it's a different particle being emitted and a different particle doing the emission, I guess, then it'll have a different vertex factor. So if it's a gluon being emitted by a quark, that'll be a factor. If it's a weak boson be, being emitted by an up quark or something like that, it'll be a different factor. And the factors can get quite complicated depending on the complexity of the force that's involved. So we're going to do some simple examples today, understand that uh, it can get much more complicated. It also depends on the spin of both the particle that's emitted and the particle that's doing the emitting. And uh, we'll see kind of how that works here in a little bit. Then in addition to that, each internal line gets a propagator. And the propagators uh, also depend on spin and mass. Um, and the difference with the propagators, the internal lines, is that they don't need to be on a mass shell. They don't need to be on the energy shell. The energy squared doesn't have to equal the momentum squared plus the mass squared. These guys are never actually measured. They're used as a part of the calculation. You integrate over all possible momenta that could happen. And so uh, they're called virtual particles. They're not real. So they don't have to be they don't have to behave like real particles. They can behave like virtual particles. <clears throat> but once they get to be external, so external lines that come in and external lines that leave the diagram correspond to real particles that you could actually measure in the laboratory. And so they are constrained to lie on the mass shell. OK. And then finally, we need to uh, keep track of all the two pi's. We'll see how to do that in a minute, but there's a lot of them. So let's, let's get to the nitty gritty now. How, what does this actually work? Let's say we have a process where we have uh, particles coming in and particles going out, and we want to compute the script M for some definite process. So the first thing we do is we label the momenta of all the things coming in and going out with P's, P1, P2, P3, up to Pn, okay? Then the internal momenta, this momenta of the particles that are inside the diagram that never actually leave. They don't come in from the outside and they don't go out to the outside. We're going to label those with Q's just to have some way to tell the difference between the, <coughs> the incoming and outgoing and then the in purely internal. Okay, uh, for each vertex we're going to put in the vertex factor. I already talked about that. For each internal line we're going to put in the propagator. I already talked about that so you get the idea what that means. And now for each vertex, we're going to include a delta function. Now, what does a, this delta function do? Um, the notion, the, the k's could be either p's or q's, but the intent is that the four momentum coming into a vertex and the four momentum going out of a vertex have to be equal. That means if you add up the four momenta coming into any vertex <coughs> where the 
where the arrows are going away from the vertex, we count that as a negative, and the, it's kind of like the Kirchhoff's current law, you know, you could write it as the sum of the currents going into a junction is equal to zero, as long as you count the currents that are leaving the junction as negative. Um, it's the same idea, except it's expressed in terms of four momentum, and since four momentum includes not only energy, but also the three components of uh, translational momentum, then this is the conservation of energy and momentum at every internal vertex. So, but remember, we're conserving energy and momentum at each vertex, but the particles involved in each vertex, if there are some internal particles, they don't necessarily behave like real particles. They, their energy and, and momenta are not, don't add up the same way they do if they were real particles. So it's, uh, it's mathematically conserving energy and momentum, but allowing for the particles involved to not behave like normal real particles. Then um, what we're going to do is integrate over all the internal momenta. So that means integrate over all possible energies, all possible x components of momentum, all possible y and z components of momentum for every internal particle in the diagram. So we're basically saying that any way it can possibly happen, we're going to let it happen, and we're going to calculate the amplitude for every possible way, and we're going to add all those amplitudes together to get the total amplitude. That's the idea. And then at the end, it turns out we're going to be left with a delta function that looks something like P1 plus P2 plus plus plus, and then minus P4, 5, up all the way up to N. Sort of looking at the diagram at the top, it would be plus P1 plus P2 plus P3 minus P4 minus P5 minus P bup, 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 up to P sub N. And notice all that does is it conserves the four momentum for the entire diagram. All the incoming momenta, four momenta, have to add up to the same thing as all the outgoing four momenta. So we're just going to throw that one away. And the reason we're going to throw it away is because that constraint is already satisfied with the kinematic part of Fermi's golden rule. We don't need it. And furthermore, we're calculating the script M here. Script M turns out to get squared when you go to calculate the decay rate or the scattering amplitude. And unfortunately, if we kept this delta function in, it would get squared and we'd be in trouble because delta functions squared are bad news. So um, you're going to just throw it out and you'll put it back in again when you calculate the, uh, the actual scattering amplitude or the decay rate. And then finally, we're going to multiply by I uh, we're going to check to see if we have more than one diagram that contributes to a process, and the diagrams differ only by the interchange of two fermions, then we're going to add the two amplitudes together, but with a minus sign. That takes care of the uh, Pauli fact that uh, when you swapped two fermions, you need to, to uh, include a minus sign. So. And I'm not using the creation annihilation operator formalism today, but if we did use that formalism, it would be taken care of by the commutation relations among the creation and annihilation operators for fermions. But uh, we're just taking a different approach. In this case, we're going to just keep track of the signs by sort of manually noticing uh, if the amplitudes that get added together correspond to simply swapping um, two fermions. Okay, so let's look at uh, a simple example to kind of see how this works. I want to discuss electron and muon scattering. So here's the diagram. Notice that I've labeled the incoming momenta, the outgoing momenta, and the internal momentum. What do we have here? We have a muon coming in at the bottom, emitting or absorbing a photon. Uh, that photon is also emitted or absorbed by the electron that comes in uh, on the top. And we want to use these rules to calculate the uh, cross-section, or actually, we're just going to calculate the script M of this process. And uh, so let's get started. The first thing we want to do is to deal with that first vertex at the top. Now, the thing is, this is a relativistic calculation, and so we need to use the relativistic form of the wave function. It turns out the solution to the relativistic form of the wave function is something called a Dirac spinner. It's not the Schrodinger equation, it's the Dirac equation, and the solutions are four component objects called spinners. And so psi1 is the momentum space wave function. We're in momentum space here because we're integrating over momentum, right? 
um, it's the momentum space wave function of the uh, Dirac electron coming in on the top. So that's the psi. It's a four component object. Then we've got the vertex factor, which in this case is just the electron factor g times i. And notice there's a gamma to the mu. Now gamma is actually a 4x4 four four matrix. And not only that, it's f a set of four 4x4 four four matrices. The set of four 4x4 four four matrices have to do with the um, Pauli matrices and the four components of the uh, spinners and so on. So it's a little complicated, but the point is we've got the incoming electron wave function, we've got the outgoing electron wave function, and we've got the vertex factor. And the fact that these are four by four matrices and there's four of them and so on is just a technical complication, but the idea is pretty, pretty straightforward. Then we've got a similar, um, oh, and don't forget the delta function. We need a delta function here to conserve momentum. So I'm, I'm taking P1 minus P3 minus Q and making a delta function with that as an argument, and that will require that P3 plus Q equals P1. So I'm thinking of Q as sort of leaving the top vertex and emitted by the top vertex and being absorbed by the bottom vertex. Of course, we're going to integrate over all Qs before we're done, so Q will be positive and negative, and so in the end, uh, as long as I'm consistent between the two delta functions for the two vertices, everything will turn out okay. Now let's go to the bottom vertex. It's similar. We've got the wave function for the outgoing um, particle P4. We've got the vertex factor, and we've got the incoming uh, muon psi 2 um, at P2. And, oh, I mentioned, I didn't mention yet the S's. The S's count for the spins the spins of the particles coming in and going out. Uh, in general, if we don't have polarized particles, we're going to have to average over the incoming spins and add for the outgoing spins. But basically, all this stuff depends on the spin, and so uh, we have to include that. And again, we get a delta function for this vertex. So there's a delta function. And this time, notice I've got P2 plus Q equals P4. And that means that uh, the I'm thinking of the photon as being absorbed at this vertex and emitted at the top vertex. Of course, you could change the signs of the Qs to go the other way, but when you integrate over all Q, it doesn't matter because Q is going to go positive and negative in any case. Now, the only thing we have left is the propagator of the photon. It turns out the propagator for a photon, which is a massless particle, is simple. It's just 1 over Q squared. Um, and the g mu nu is the metric. So that's going to allow us to contract the gamma matrix from the upper vertex and the gamma matrix for the bottom vertex. When we calculate all those numbers, um, we will get a pure number. So when you plug all that in, okay, oh, and we're going to integrate over all q. So when you plug all that in and do the integral, it turns out the delta function, let's say, let's look at the top delta function. It requires that p1 um, the q equals p1 minus p3. So when I integrate over delta function, that means I can simply replace q with p1 minus p3, and it's all right. So that's a trivial integral. I can just stick it uh, right in, and notice what I end up with is a number. It's a number because the thing in the brackets there on the bottom is um, the outgoing Let's see, it's the outgoing muon bar. Now, a bar is kind of like a row version of the Dirac spinner. And psi 2 is the incoming mu. It's a column vector of the Dirac spinner. And that row and that column, when they multiply together, they make a number. But uh, including the gamma matrix, the gamma is a 4 by 4. So we, what we get in that right-hand bracket is a number for every value of mu. And then... Um, the left-hand bracket, we get a number for every value of mu. Notice that the right-hand gamma now has a subscript. That because that's because the original um, gamma sub nu got contracted with the g mu nu from the propagator of the photon. So that's a lot of monkey business. And if you haven't done any relativistic math before, that may be all gobbledygook for you. 
what matters is that uh, when you get done, when the smoke clears, this is a number. It's a number that depends on the value of P1 and P3, but it is just a pure number. There's no matrices, there's no vectors, nothing left here but the amplitude. So the point is you can do the calculation if you know how to fill in the blanks for the various vectors and matrices, um, you get a pure number. And uh, once you have this number, of course, you can go back to Fermi's Golden Rule, stick it in, and calculate the cross-section for this process. And that's the idea. So if you don't feel like you have a great understanding of how this actually works, it's okay. I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that go into the process. And the notion that what we're really doing is adding up that this diagram represents really a uh, a lot of different things that can happen physically, but we're adding up the amplitude of each of those things happening to get the overall amplitude for the diagram. Okay, let's look at another case that I promised I would look at. Uh, this is electron-positron annihilation. So it's a similar setup, a similar deal, except this time it's photons that are leaving and electrons and positrons that are coming in. So now I've got a phi bar uh, that corresponds to the positron uh, coming in. Notice that that's an electron line going backwards in time, so that's like a positron coming in. And uh, then the epsilon has to do with the polarization of the photon. Photons are spin one objects, they have polarization, right or left circular polarization in this case. And so, and then the vertex factor, again, is the same thing we had before, it's the gamma. But this time the gamma is contracting a little differently. It's contracting against the polarization of the photon rather than contracting with the uh, propagator of the... F there's no photon propagator in this diagram because there's no uh, virtual photon exchanged. They're, these are both real photons and so there's no photon propagator. Um, so the contraction is a little different. The the uh, delta function works the same way. And then the bottom vertex, it's uh, very similar to the top vertex, except this time we have a, an electron, that's a psi. So the, the psi's are the electrons and the phi's are the positrons, basically. They're different in the Dirac spinner. The uh, psi's have large values on the top two components and the phi's have large values on the bottom two components. But anyway, um, those are all technicalities. We also get a delta function from that bottom vertex. And finally, there's a propagator in this diagram, but it's an electron propagator, not a photon propagator. So that's a little different. Um, and notice that it's got a gamma matrix in it, but it contracts with the momentum of the internal uh, virtual electron. So uh, it's a little different technically. Also notice this propagator has mass, whereas the propagator for the photon doesn't. And so we end up with um, a little more complicated expression when the smoke clears. Again, you're going to integrate over all the internal momenta. And so that's how it works. And um, I want to define a shorthand. It's called slash notation. Basically, you'll notice that there are these gamma matrices. The epsilon for, partic for photon 3 contracts with the gamma for that vertex, and the epsilon for photon 4 contracts with the gamma for that vertex, and then the gamma and the internal momentum of the uh, virtual electron contracts with its own gamma. And so we can save ourselves a lot of writing if we use that substitution, and then we end up with uh, putting in the delta functions again. We end up with an amplitude that looks terrible. It's got, uh, it's got slashed photon 3, it's got slashed photon 4, it's got slashed momentum 2 and slashed momentum 4. But those are basically just uh, sums over various gamma matrices multiplied by components of uh, various four vectors. So um, anyway, the point is this is again just a number. It's a number that depends on momentum 1 and momentum 2, but you can compute it. Um, oh, and, and momentum 4, I should say. So you can compute the thing, and it'll come out something. Uh, then it turns out there's also another diagram. I'm not going to go through all the vertices and the propagator for this diagram, but I'll just point out what the answer turns out to be. It looks like this. And uh, if you plug all that in and add them up and do the calculations of the various slashes and so on, uh, 
astonishingly, what you get if you consider only the singlet of the positron and the electron. So you force the positron and electron in a singlet state, which is a superposition of spin up and spin down, and you, and you plug all that in. It turns out you get minus 4 times GE squared. That's how the whole thing turns out. If you plug that back into the kinematic equation for the scattering cross-section, and you put in what GE is in terms of the fine structure constant, um, and I'm going to go ahead and put the h-bars and the c's back in now so we can get the units right, uh, you end up with a partial differential cross-section that just has the mass of the positron and the mass of the electron, and then, the vol then their relative velocity, v. Um, so it's actually an astonishingly simple result. It's very complicated to get there, but once you get there, it's not too bad. Notice that there's no angular dependence left here. The, the cross-section is independent of angle, and that means that um, the total cross-section for this is simply 4 pi times that. And you might recognize this looks a little bit like the neutron capture cross-section we got back when we studied the formation of a deuteron, and uh, it goes like 1 over v, just like that one did. You may also remember that we there was a relationship between the lifetime, the rate at which the capture occurred, and the um, cross-section for the capture. In fact, I think we did this thing backwards. We used Fermi's golden rule to get the cross-section, or to get the rate of capture, and then we worked backwards to get the cross-section. But in this case, what we're going to do is use the cross-section to calculate the rate. I can just multiply by the density of the, the probability density, in this case, of the um, electron-positron pair, and multiply that by the velocity. Notice that sigma times velocity is independent of velocity, so that it doesn't matter how fast these guys are going. Um, the rate turns out to be the same either way. What do I use for density? Well, I could just use the wave function evaluated at the origin because that's where the two guys are coming into contact. And uh, that turns out to be, remember the wave function is nothing other than the hydrogen, hydrogenic wave function with the reduced mass of the proton and the positron. So that comes out pretty easy. And when you plug all that in, you get a lifetime, one over the uh, decay rate, of about an eighth of a nanosecond, which is what I mentioned the other day. And uh, that's a triumph for uh, all this crazy theory that you get an answer that it corresponds to the actual lifetime of positronium. So there you have it. All right, next time, we'll, I promise, I'll talk about the Higgs and other fun stuff. We'll wrap up. This will be our, our last actual lesson for the semester. Uh, lesson 40 is just going to be review and prep for the final exam. So we'll see you guys next time.